Hey guys, this is GKCS. Today we'll be attempting to design DoorDash, which in case you're from India, you know about Swiggy or Zomato. These are food delivery apps and DoorDash seems to be doing very well in the US, at least in terms of the number of customers. Uh, the idea is simple. People order food from a restaurant and uh, somebody needs to pick that food up and deliver it to the person who's ordered it. Here we are collaborating with Jordan Epstein. Jordan has an amazing channel on YouTube, which talks about designing systems and about software engineering. You should definitely check it out. Let me let Jordan introduce himself. Hey guys, uh, my name is Jordan. Nice to meet you all if you've never heard of me. Um, basically, around six months ago, I started trying to teach myself systems design um, in a lot of my spare time. I'm pretty new to it all because I'm actually a new grad software engineer over at Google in the United States. Um, but, you know, it's been coming along well. I've been learning a lot and I'm trying to uh, kind of re-impart what I've been learning on my channel as well. So feel free to check that out. Also, you'll see I have kind of, uh, you know, um, low quality webcam in this video with Gorov, but at least now I get to introduce myself all to you guys and show you my ugly face in high definition. So enjoy the video. Hope it helps. So Jordan, uh, firstly, hello <laughs> and uh, welcome to the systems design interview. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, this is the opportunity to hopefully not embarrass myself in front of too many people. So let's get that started. Um, Whatever and, happens with the education. So that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Exactly. Especially for me. Okay. So I guess I should probably start out by trying to list some sort of functional requirements. And so when you say DoorDash, I'm assuming that what you mean is that someone has the ability to place an order. Um, and then generally speaking from there, what you're going to do is get matched with a nearby dasher who is going to go ahead and deliver the order um, that delivers. Yes. And then once you're matched, you can actually go ahead and see the location of the driver and they can see your location. Sound about right? Yes. Okay. So uh, right off the bat, before I get into too much functionality, I guess another thing I should try and do is list something like capacity constraints um, or some sort of estimation in terms of uh, you know, how many users we have using the app so we can get a sense of the scale we're working with. And you know, that'll help us get into a sense of partitioning or load balancing or things along those lines because I think that's going to be very central for a problem like this. Um, okay. So for starters, um, I'm not sure if I should necessarily be asking you this or more so just trying to ballpark it myself, but do you have a sense of how many active users we have? And I guess also we're saying DoorDash, but is this a global service? Is it just for one region? Are we looking at one city? Are we deploying at the beginning or later? So I'm kind of curious to uh, know there what you think. So uh, let's assume that this is just in the US uh, and uh, we have, uh, we have, let's say, 10 million active users. Okay. Uh, so amongst those 10 million active users, uh, the number of orders which happen per day is roughly 10 million. Okay. One order per day per user. Okay. So I'm trying to think about now what that might necessarily mean. So let's say that um, per user, we're probably going to be storing things like, um, you know, a, an email address, um, perhaps their location, things along those lines. And I'd say conservatively, it's probably going to end up being maybe a few hundred bytes per user in just say like a user table, because, you know, the, uh, each character is basically two bytes. So email is going to be like 32 or something like that. And then we go ahead and scale that out with a few other, you know, just certain preferences and things like that. Um, oh, another thing, just because I haven't really covered it, um, are we going to focus on kind of like the payments aspect of this, or can we assume that that's kind of just being outsourced to something like Stripe for the moment? Yes. Uh, one of the things that we are focusing on is delivery. Uh, so let's say, uh, onboarding users, uh, or onboarding the, the shops or, or, uh, you know, finding out where they are is not what we are focusing on. Payments right. is also not something we're focusing on. We're just focusing on the delivery aspect of things. Okay. If you like, you, you can try to figure out how does DoorDash uh, find out where a person is, uh, but even more important will be how do they connect them? Yep, okay, so we're, we're focusing more on the location aspect. So I'll, I'll start touching upon that right after I, I do this, uh, this estimation basically. 
Um, sure. Oh, and then additionally, um, in addition to the active users, how many um, dashers can we anticipate having? Do we have like a relatively even distribution of dashers to users? And um, oh, so I, I'm assuming that a person can make about 20 deliveries a day um, on average. So then we come down to something like 10 million orders uh, turns out to be roughly one or 500,000. Right, that, that turns out to be 500,000 uh, active delivery personnel. That's a lot of people. <laughs> that's, that's a huge number of people. Um, is that even possible? 500,000 dashers? Uh, I think that's uh, pretty possible. There are f about 400 million people in the US, so it's not a, a huge chunk. You get distributed quite a bit. Well, that, that'll be more than the population of Iceland. But yeah, let's <laughs> go for 500,000 dashers. Yeah, at country. this point, I as an interviewer, I'm taking responsibility for the assumptions that we are making. So 500,000 dashes, yes, let's go ahead. Sure. Um, so right now, just quick uh, estimation on the user table. I said 5,000 megabytes, which is equal to about 5 gigabytes. So it doesn't necessarily have to be partitioned, but maybe for you know future, um, future sakes, we can start considering that. Sorry, and then you also said about 500,000 dashers because we're going to need a dashers table and kind of the big aspect of this problem is going to be, um, you know, how we shard based on location. So I don't think that space is probably going to be our biggest constraint here, but it's more so going to be um, how we go ahead and kind of approach this geo sharding or partitioning um, and going ahead and notifying people of which drivers might actually be near them. So I'm probably going to start now by just covering um, some certain just you know API endpoints that we'll have to anticipate. Um, you know we obviously have to have the ability to create an account, which is just going to take in a bunch of user info, which I don't really need to go into at the moment. But we'll just go ahead and say something like that. Um, there's also place order, which is going to be where the majority of our um, kind of impact comes into play. We're placing an order for a specific restaurant. And then in addition to that, that's gonna have to go ahead and get to the actual, you know, lat long of the, the customer. So, but generally speaking, we don't really care as much about the customer address when matching um, a restaurant with uh, a DoorDasher. What we care about more so is just the proximity of the DoorDasher to the actual restaurant itself, because the distance from the restaurant to the customer is going to be constant. So we just want to, you know, generally speaking, find someone nearby. Um, and then we also want to be able to see the location of the driver, and they can also see your location. I don't necessarily know that that requires an endpoint, because as I'll talk about in a little bit, that's kind of... Um, a real-time update and so it may be more relevant to use something like a WebSocket there. So quickly just to talk about um, the actual um, data sources that we're going to be using. Um, for simplicity, I'm probably just going to go ahead and use some sort of MySQL database to hold the user information um, just because people are familiar with that, but there's really no reason that you couldn't use a NoSQL database. Um, something like Cassandra here, since there's not really too many um, relational aspects within the data, everything is pretty decoupled. It would enable us to use fast writes because Cassandra kind of has this LSM architecture and it also has this masterless replication schema. And so as a result of that, that works totally fine. But I think that people just kind of, you know, are in terms of development, if we're not overly concerned about the speed of that create account endpoint, then something like a MySQL data, uh, database works just fine. And to ensure that no user information gets lost, we can go ahead and just use replication, probably single leader because it's the most simple. We don't have to deal with potential conflicts. And in the event that that single leader replica went down, we could go ahead and perform a failover. And to kind of deal with that failover, we might use something like a consensus-based coordination service like Zookeeper or etcd. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the user information. And then I guess the other advantage of using MySQL here is that even though we're not talking about payment processing, in the event that we did do payment processing, we probably want a relational database because ACID transactions are going to be really good for that. So that's kind of thinking outside of the scope of this, but uh, just something I'm considering. Okay, then this is kind of the bread and butter of the problem, which is going to be um, the fact that we want to be able to quickly match people with a nearby dasher that delivers. So this is where we want some sort of geo-sharded um, database 
And in the interest of speed, I would probably go ahead and do this in memory on something like Redis. And I'll, I'll get, in, get into this now because this is kind of where the, the crux of this problem lies. So the first thing is, is this, and I'm, I'm thinking about kind of the design of Uber right now because I've learned about that before and it's very similar to this. Basically, the way that Uber works is they go ahead and um, I'm, I'm debating whether it's worth it to talk about geohashes right now or sharding first, but I guess I'll talk about geohashes first because we want to be able to kind of provide an index. So anyways, basically, we now have this, this concept of a geosharded database. So I think that each geosharded database should basically go ahead and be its own um, mini geo geohash index for a bunch of points in a region. So I can discuss now how this geohash works. Um, okay, create. Uh, so you have a geo-sharded database which you're going for. This is the algorithm that you want to use. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yep. uh, you have, you mentioned that you have a set of stores and people can go and pick up the order from the store. The right. good news is that the, the, the algorithm that you're using is, okay, store to delivery point uh, is going to be constant for every order. It's just the saving that you can make is delivery person to store. Right. Exactly. So the first half of the or, or the first part of the problem. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Absolutely. Right. So basically, more or less. Um, sorry, I'm still getting used to this interface a little bit, but um, every single uh, restaurant is going to when we're onboarding a restaurant. We're probably going to get some sort of lat long. Um, so when we're onboarding a restaurant, we have some sort of latitude and longitude for it. Um, we're probably going to need some further service that basically goes ahead and takes this latitude and longitude and converts it to a geohash. And then once we have that geohash, we're going to have to actually go ahead and index each restaurant in the proper geo shard. So, um, Basically, the point of this now is that every single restaurant, uh, a geohash, if I can try and draw it out, I'm going to draw this box here. Um, okay, are you able to see that box? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Um, so basically, uh, a geohash works by taking a 2D area and converting it into all of these mini boxes such that... Okay. Every single mini box has um, a hash that has additional characters tacked onto the big box. So let's say I have this um, big box with a geo hash of QR42. QR42. And then we go ahead and every single mini box is going to be. QR42 with one more character appended. So QR42A, and then we have, um, you know, QR42B. Got it. Got it. So your every is it uh, is it recursive in the sense that does it split it into four pieces every time and you keep going deeper? Yeah, not necessarily four. It could be nine. It could be thirty-two. But the point is, you basically reach infinite depth using this geohashing map to the point that because every single inner box is the outer box plus one character, using a typical index of a database like a B tree, where you're able to sort between two ranges of keys, means that between the key QR42 and the key QR43, I know that all of the locations within that bigger bounding box of QR42 are going to be located there. So because okay. databases are specifically purposed such that when keys are sorted, you can quickly find things, what this allows you to do is it allows you to basically go from one geohash and use a binary search to quickly find all of the nearby places. So basically, every single time we onboard a restaurant, uh, we would use some existing service, and I'm sure there are public APIs out there for this because it's not worth it to create your own geohashes. There are people out there who make maps that are much better at this. Uber is one example. They did it hexagonally. Um, basically, the point is, is that you would go ahead and call this service to get the geohash for a corresponding lat long, and that way you can put each restaurant in the proper partition indexed by um, that uh, geohash, if that makes sense. Okay. This, this is amazing. Uh, in fact, what you can do, like you said, you can do uh, some sort of a reinsearch uh, and 
I mean, you have these geo hashes in your B tree or in some sorted order because of which you are able to do right. um, a binary search on it effectively. Yeah, so, I guess in the case of Redis, since it's in memory, we're not actually going to be using a B tree. We're going to be using a sorted set, and then we would go ahead and binary search that. Amazing. Uh, I have a, one problem though. Uh, for example, let's say QR forty two. Mm -hmm. um, let me draw another box here, which is QR forty one. Sure. Um, now, if you have a point over here, right, right on the edge, right, then this point and this point are close by. Right. So typically, um, the way that you rectify this difference is that each geo hash basically has a certain depth to it. And that's the way the map is divided. So first of all, you would actually be able to go ahead and um, use that depth to kind of say, oh, well, um, here's the, the size of box that I probably need to incorporate to look at a certain radius of points. And another thing is to basically say, not only am I looking within my own bounding box, I probably have to look within, you know, say the nine bounding boxes all bordering that middle bounding box. Um, by virtue of doing that, you can pretty much ensure that as long as the size of each surrounding uh, geohash is bigger than that radius of points that you want to consider, you can really easily go ahead and make sure that you're finding every point. So instead of doing one range query, you're actually doing nine disjoint range queries. However, um, you know, since we can parallelize this uh, through a variety of ways, you know, just running a multi-threaded query or something along those lines, it's still pretty efficient to be able to do this, and it's only scaled by a constant factor, which in this case is going to be nine. Okay, Jordan, that's a, that's a really good idea. For example, um, is, is this what you mean? You have a point here, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have we have this box, which is one box, which will be encapsulating it. Yep. There's uh, another one, which is taken for a different geohash, uh, which maybe ends here, uh, and then there's another one over here. And so there, uh, you were talking about nine queries. So is, is this what you mean? You have different geo hashes? Kind uh, of. Where... Okay. Well, okay. the thing is, the, the one thing that we are thinking of differently here is that you're allowing these boxes to overlap, which is something that you might see with like an R tree for indexing polygons. But with geo hashes, yeah. all of these bounding boxes are disjoint. So actually, what you would really have is kind of that brown box in the middle over here, and then you would have all of these boxes surrounding it. Um, oh. And then, you know, I would have a, if I can copy and paste, can I do that? No, it doesn't seem like it yet, but soon. And then uh, basically, by doing this, I would be able to, sorry, this one's a little too small. I can say, <laughs> imagine that the size of each box is, uh, is four miles by four miles and I want to be able to find all points within three miles, I know that by simply just searching all the boxes around it, I can guarantee that all the relevant points are going to be within these nine. So I can just search these nine geo hashes right there. Okay, okay. So that's, that's a very interesting idea. Um, and in fact, it, it works. It works because one of the things that you can do, uh, okay, mathematically, of course, it's, it's, it's taken care of. I'm just wondering... Mm -hmm. um, once you actually get to these points, uh, let's say someone is far enough away, let's say they are over here. Sure. Uh, and there's another person who's just over here. Oh, I uh, see. Uh, maybe they can tell you their distance by looking at the GPS right now and, uh, you know, uh, they can maybe accept or reject the delivery based on that. Right. Uh, is that, that could be one possibility. Uh, well, okay. So, uh, this is, but we are uh, talking about onboarding stores. So, yes. not... Okay. Okay. Sorry. This is good. Let's, let's go ahead with it. Yeah. yeah. Just just to your point earlier, obviously with with this configuration here, you run the risk of finding some points that are slightly out of your range, and so basically what you initially get are a much more limited set of points to actually filter out. And but you're eventually going to have to run this client side filtering. You don't just get to return all of these points, and you're probably going to have to hit some service that actually goes ahead and takes the lat long of all these points which are stored within that index and then run some sort of you know gps service or api type thing like that that goes ahead and calculates the cartesian distance between them which i think is just a mathematical uh i think it's just like the pythagorean formula so it shouldn't be too hard mm -hmm. to do um yeah, but yeah you do eventually have to filter out some extra points 
yeah there's one thing that we are um, we'll need to take care of that the road over here might be all twisty and turny mm-hmm. and full of traffic and this one might be a straight road right so like you said on the client side maybe we can uh, the, we can figure that out the way that i've typically seen um people do this is that they pre-calculate or they pre-cache just the the distance of popular roads between uh, two tiles. And I think that's kind of how Google Maps works, where you're not exactly always necessarily taking the quickest path, but you know you look at a couple of main roads and it's almost like um, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm where you're, you're basically saying for any two tiles, here's what I know the distance is between them. And so that way you can kind of um, use that distance between two tiles in order to basically say, you know, if now I see two things that are three tiles away, I can kind of add the, the combined distance between all those two tiles. Um, and I guess you could go ahead and just store those in some in-memory hash map if there are few enough tiles. If there are too many tiles, then you would probably have to use some sort of um, other indexing structure, maybe just on a relational database with indexes on, you know, both columns of the tiles. but. I think that's typically the way that you would do it is you would probably have some some huge batch process that um, runs a while ago and just goes ahead and calculates that distance between the two every once in a while to make sure it's up to date. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, in fact, let's assume that all the delivery persons are using Google Maps uh, and that we don't we aren't really solving this problem uh, of you know finding the quickest person we are finding. Uh, the, we, are, we are solving the problem of finding a person who is near enough or will reach the restaurant quick enough right so then this this algorithm is great uh, cool. it shards things uh, geographically uh, and you can also it's also variable so if i really want to get someone within eight miles also then you're just asking me to query more shards right or, yeah. or, or a big larger level shard yeah, so, yeah that will, yeah. You just query that larger area basically, and then filter down the number of points more or less. Um, but since you know that you shouldn't have too many points around there in the first place, it shouldn't take a huge toll um, compared to you know right. say just <laughs> brute forcing it, scanning the entire database, and then filtering from there, which would take a really long time. Um, Got it. Got but it. so first you query one shard, then you query the outer shard, then the outer one if, if, if it's possible, and then you just say, okay, I'm sorry, there's no delivery person nearby. Basically, yeah. I mean, I guess you could configure how far you're willing to try to, you know, it's kind of like how Uber and Lyft will eventually give up when trying to find you a driver. They'll just say, sorry, it looks like you're out of luck or you're screwed. Um, and Yes, yeah, yeah, you can walk back home, yes. Sure. Um, in terms of the actual other functionality here, so we, we've discussed, you know, how once, uh, once we have all of these nearby dashers, we can go ahead and um, pick one. However, I guess we should also discuss how each um, nearby dasher is going to be in the right shard in the first place. So I guess every um, every few seconds, we should probably have some service, and I'll, I'll start writing again. Um, let's see. Oh, it looks like you can zoom out a little bit. So this is going to be, I guess I'll call it like the, uh, the driver update service. So the driver is running some software on their phone that um, periodically is going to be sending updates to some sort of table. And so not only is the driver going to, not only is there gonna be some sort of driver table where we have all of those drivers listed in there, but it's important that each driver uh, every once in a while is being sharded to the proper geo sharded Redis instance so that they can also be in the correct instance so that upon trying to um, you know, order from a restaurant, we can go ahead and find those nearby drivers. So we know that this driver update service, um, let's see, can I type in here? Yes, okay. So update every, I don't know, five seconds. Oh, did I just delete something? Shoot, sorry. Uh, That's fine. Yeah, uh, we update every five seconds more or less with the lat long that we get with the phone. And then all we're going to go ahead and do is first we have to go ahead and call, uh, I'm imagining this is on the background, call a service that converts lat long to geohash. And then we're going to have to, uh, from there, send the um, driver uh, coordinates 
to the proper geosharded index and also possibly remove it from the one that it was previously in if it's switched. Remove from previous. Uh, okay, one sec. Okay. Okay. So okay. basically, yes. now what this does is it makes sure that um, all of those driver coordinates are in the proper geosharded index. But I also haven't really discussed yet how it is that these geoshards are being broken down. So typically, what I would do is I would go ahead and basically take any of these geoshard boxes. Uh, and we could pick them from arbitrary size. I guess um, we could either do some sort of dynamic partitioning or um, just pick something like a static size for now and then see how that goes for us. But basically the point is, is that we want to take some size of these um, geo hashes, say corresponding to like a five by five kilometer area. And then we want to go ahead and use some sort of like consistent hashing system such that they get evenly distributed over um, all of the Redis clusters. And then, you know, in order to kind of maintain that consistent hashing setup, we could use another coordination service to discuss which partitions are on which servers, um, which does add a little bit of latency in the sense that you have to do that. Um, you could use a load balancer as well, which keeps that locally. But um, I think uh, the coordination service just works for, for keeping things in check. But if latency is our main goal here, which it actually may be, because that's why we're using Redis in the first place, then perhaps something like a gossip protocol between all of those Redis instances saying who has which shard would go ahead and work better for, you know, you send a point to one Redis cluster and then that forwards it to the right one. So that's also another option for maintaining okay. which server has which partition. Um, okay. But anyway, one, yeah. Sorry. Right. So th these, these servers, uh, we, they have consistent hashing. Uh, they have uh, a gossip protocol. Uh, so the discovery of which server holds what partition or what set of partitions uh, is easy. Yep. Okay. What about consistency here in the sense that what if, is it possible that two servers are holding the same range? Let's say there's a particular geohash. Is it possible that that geohash exists in multiple servers? Well, I mean, yes, in the sense that these should be replicated. And yes, also possibly in the sense that a gossip protocol is something that is eventually consistent and goes ahead and shares messages after a bit. Um, I think that's why there's an argument to be made for having a coordination service instead. But keep in mind that since driver update service is happening every five seconds, um, eventually, even if the gossip protocol takes a while to, to propagate to every single node, we would go ahead and eventually be sending all of those points to the right place. And um, so I don't think it would be a huge deal if things are, are slightly stale on the data front, but um, I, I guess yeah, yeah you, you do run with some eventual consistency there. Right, uh, that, that's a good point. So it, because it takes five seconds or maybe even more for us to find a driver, uh, find a delivery executive, that time is sufficient not just to be eventually consistent. That time is required because we, we are running our algorithms. Uh, you know, food is not going to get prepared in three seconds. We probably don't need to assign a person immediately. Uh, we can take a minute. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, and then... This, right. Uh, the, the Redis cluster. So if this... Okay. Uh, you also are fault tolerant to some extent because you have consistent hashing. So if some node goes down, then the rest of the nodes kind of take up that... Uh, those those regions. Right, yeah, the goal is to balance the sharding out as much as possible so that if any node goes down, you don't just have a thundering herd problem where you have to rebalance a ton of partitions to one place and overload the network, but instead just rebalance the minimum possible number of partitions. You don't really need a replication here, do you? Like, I suppose it's not too important in the sense that you could just go ahead and um, rebuild the index for, for this guy here. Um, Although it would be nice to be able to have if one goes down um, so that you don't have to wait for those partitions to rebalance. And it would also just be good so that none of those Redis servers get overloaded by being able to have you know replicas of them if uh, we're constantly querying to you know find the nearby drivers for one restaurant, then it could help reduce the load on any given node. But yeah, I guess it's not overly important. Okay. Okay. Let's let's try to draw that out. Uh, let's say you have these nodes. Sorry, 
this is going to take forever. Uh, <laughs> All good. No, uh, it's. I, I hope it's got this. Doesn't it have a? Okay, doesn't. <laughs> it, I think there's a shortcut. Uh, I'll have to check that out later. But okay, you have these nodes, um, and if you have replication, my concern is that this data is not just eventually consistent. Like it, it is eventually consistent, yes, but in the loosest term, because there are certain updates which will go to some shard, and there are certain updates which will go to some other shard um, in memory. So if you're keeping a replica in memory, which is like a uh, which is like a primary secondary kind of thing where all the updates go to a write node and one goes to a read node let's say this is the sorry uh, let's say this is the write node and this is the read node okay so read is red uh, write is green um, i'm just wondering why do we have this uh, other replica like are we going to figure out very quickly in in a second or something that this node is down sure uh, uh, well okay. on the on the consistent hashing um on the consistent hashing ring, I think you actually don't put read-only replicas. You actually only put the the write replicas because right. um, that's where you're actually routing those writes. So, I mean, you could okay. just do some sort of type of single leader replication from uh, the first node to any followers that it might have. And then, you know, this could be useful if, say, we're using a coordination service where the, the primary is constantly sending heartbeats to the coordination service to ensure that it's up or down. And then that way, if so, we could perform failover. But yeah, I, I agree that it's really not a huge deal, especially when you're maintaining anything in memory in the first place to necessarily have that as long as right. we're, we're capable of spinning up another you know, Redis instance relatively quickly if it goes down. But I still think that um, you know, being able to have something that already has the majority of the index data in there, and it will have it because okay. it'll have most of the restaurants, um, and then we'll quickly get repopulated by all the drivers five seconds later could be pretty useful just because the okay. you have to keep the restaurants in there, which is the tough part. The drivers will come back themselves. Okay, okay. So um, uh, the restaurants can be probably pulled up from the database. Um, the drivers also, what about the drivers? They, they'll come back in the sense the client will send uh, some sort of a signal which will tell them that, hey, I, I exist over here. I'm near, uh, you know, I, Here's my coordinate, basically. Here are my coordinates. Lat long, I'm here. Uh, and is that how you will populate this uh, this ring for the riders? So let's say green is now, red is the store, uh, and green is drivers. So Sorry. is that the idea? So, so I'm a little bit confused here by what you're asking, just because I'm saying that the, the Redis cluster should just be used to go ahead and match a user with a driver. Once that user and driver have been matched, we can go ahead and update the user and driver tables to basically say that these two have you know, been matched. Um, and then once we have that match between them, then we can start using some sort of real-time streaming protocol, like either a WebSocket or a server sent event. Probably a WebSocket is better because we're going to have bi-directional communication. Um, but Basically, in order to yeah, so basically the the Redis cluster and the geo sharding is there just to find that match, and then once we go ahead and find that match, we remove them from the geo shard, and would go ahead and um, start propagating their location updates to the actual customer, as opposed to you know having them in the pool. For you matches. don't have any drivers in this ring, right? Uh, in the ring, I certainly do have them in, in the Redis cluster. They're, they're going in the Redis cluster, but it's just once they're matched, they can get removed. Okay, so when do they get added to the Redis cluster? When they make a, a request, when there's an order, is that when we have them in the Redis cluster? Sorry, so when it's actually they're in the Redis cluster when they are when they are not performing an order. So every single time that they're like updating their current location to, to look for a potential job, it's important that they're in the Redis cluster. So when that eventual request comes in for a restaurant, a restaurant can go ahead and perform a range query from its location and that way find all the nearest drivers. So that's kind of where this geo sharding okay. aspect comes in. Okay, so uh, let's say, uh, you know, Here's this person, uh, the the green box are delivery people, uh, and there's this order over here on this box. So we now need to find nearby 
delivery person. So this person is nearby, this person is also nearby. Um, what do we do? How, how do we find this? Uh, oh, I see. Are you using this ring right here to represent the index or are you using it to represent consistent hashing? Because I think that's where we're Oh, yes. Yes, that's the mistake. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually confusing the consistent hashing thing with the index. So that okay. does not make sense. Yes. I was thinking okay, of in it. Fact, in fact, you're right. Uh, they are in the Redis cluster in the index, yes. but not in the consistent hashing thing. Exactly. It's just one Redis cluster and that one Redis cluster would contain, or this one Redis node would contain a bunch of drivers and probably the restaurant that we're looking to query from. Okay, okay, uh, yeah, that that is that makes total sense. So you have you have a separate table. Exactly. It's not hashing. You have a separate table which which has uh, the hash, the geo hash. Yep. And then you probably have a type like is this a uh, is this a store or is it a person? Exactly. Who's going to be delivering, and and then you have. Uh, other details okay exactly yeah and then so okay. once a restaurant is pinged to basically say we have an order from here we would go ahead and um, run a range query basically starting at the location of that restaurant to find all the nearby points and uh, okay that would be on the sorted set in redis to quickly find all of these nearby cars and then we would pick one of them through some sort of scoring algorithm that we don't really have to get into the details of and then once we have that, that's when we start propagating the location between the customer and the driver. Okay. One important thing that you again mentioned here is that um, if the delivery person is busy, if they already are making an order, you're not going to be considering them. Correct. Because, yes. Uh, they will not correct. be in any Redis cluster if they're making an order. Okay. So we, what we are doing here is that we are saying it may be possible that you're coming really close to this restaurant. Um, after your order is finished, you might actually end up closer here. Uh, so for example, you are here right now. Mm -hmm. Your delivery position is over here. Uh, this has nothing to do with the consistent hashing. Right. Just came to this. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, let's say let's say you are over here uh, at the end of the delivery and there's another person who's right now over here. So by the time that they reach the restaurant, uh, this person will have reached even closer. So the distance here is going to be one kilometer or uh, a mile and uh, in that time, this person will still be five miles away, uh, but that's okay. That's fine because yeah, I think in a naive implementation, I, I'm sure there's an optimization where you can start kind of actually queuing up jobs for drivers, and that's kind of what you see a lot of these current day ride services do, where they they make a smarter algorithm that basically says. Well, here's what you're going to do next based on where you're going to end up. So we could probably make some optimization like that where we compute where that driver is going to be because we know where, where, where they're going to be delivering to. And then we could maybe add them to that, um, you know, that corresponding geohash. But I think for now, in terms of just a naive implementation, it's sufficient to probably just say a driver is only going to be doing one role at a time. Yes, yes. Uh, it simplifies the system. It also... Uh... Yeah, it simplifies the system a lot because you might spend three minutes over here. So by that time, maybe this person is one kilometer away anyway. Exactly. So, okay, uh, this is great. We have a way in which we can actually, so I'll, I'll just uh, kind of take a step back uh, and look at what we have done. So we are able to update the driver's locations by actually uh, making those updates in this table that we have. Uh, over here, we are also able to onboard stores through this geohash algorithm. Um, okay, we are able to now match drivers to stores. We, we are basically uh, able to match drivers to orders based on how far they are from a store. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and the way we are doing that is by storing these locations in memory. Uh, most of these places will be in cities. So I think uh, to some extent, yeah, caching makes a lot of sense here uh, using something like Redis. Uh, and we can horizontally scale because you have used uh, an algorithm which either has a coordinator or consistent hashing, whatever be the case. And you don't have replication, so that takes like, away, uh, care of some of the eventual consistency that we have. Uh, okay. And also what you're doing is you're storing just the the store locations instead of the 
driver locations, which again simplifies things because if a driver goes offline, there's really not much of a point keeping that point. Uh, I mean, keeping that uh, entry in this table. Right. Yeah. You could always put for, especially for the type of drivers, you could always put um, an expiration such that they're, they're invalid if that expiration hasn't been updated because, you know, say they haven't sent an update for 10 minutes, you can just assume that they're offline and, you know, kind right. of put a TTL there. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm, uh, is there anything else that it's a DoorDash does, which is a critical thing in our system? Uh, the last piece of the puzzle that I could think of was just um, seeing the location of the driver once you've been matched with them. And that, uh, yes. that's kind of... Right. So my logic is um, once you're matched, all you have to go ahead and do is... Um, basically, at this point, you as the, the driver and um, basically the, the user have to go ahead and start communicating in real time with some server, probably just, um, so I would, I would probably have some secondary service known as um, like the, the I, I don't know, client driver location service that first you have a load balancer in front of it such that the driver and the client are matched to the same server. And then from then on, they're both going ahead and sending their location via WebSockets, which is just lat long. And then okay. the server is going to go ahead and send those uh, pings back to the corresponding parties to see where each other are. Okay, amazing. Because you have this driver here, you have a server here, uh, you make a connection, uh, and then this is a peer-to-peer -peer connection that you're going for because because uh, hmm. so why do we need a peer-to-peer -peer connection here? Does so, it, is it because the server needs to send updates to the client from time to time? Uh, well, well, isn't it so that, uh, sorry, we the whole point of the functionality is to be able to see in real time where the other party is located, right? I guess you could establish some sort of direct, um, you know, web socket between the two of them. So, yeah, I, th I think the, the point is that um, basically we want to, I don't know, persist those locations on some sort of database. Maybe we want to be able to process them later. Or if, uh, I don't know, perhaps there's some issue in connecting the driver and client. Maybe it's best to put a server in between. But I see your point that perhaps a direct WebSocket is the, the fastest and best way to go ahead and do that. I'm actually not sure. But uh, yeah, I think you can horizontally scale out these servers just via a load balancer so that we know the client and driver are going to be connected to the same one. Okay. Okay, so... All right. I'm, I'm just wondering, do we need a, a WebSocket? Or, because WebSockets are... Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. They have a two-way uh, yeah, communication, oh. which which ends up, you know, they hold on to the connection for a while. Do you sure. What do you think about HTTP long polling or something? I think long polling is fine here. However, there are some downsides, such as headers having to be resent and potentially really hammering a server if, um, because we're, we're gonna long pull very frequently. We're getting very frequent location updates. So we're gonna constantly be reestablishing and killing those, um, those connections. I think if anything, as opposed to WebSockets, you would just be better off with server-side events because that's still a persistent connection, but at the same time, um, it's not, it doesn't have to be bi-directional. You can just go ahead and send like a post request to the server. I think that long polling, it, it definitely is perfectly functional here, but I just feel like if you have a bunch of delivery drivers and a bunch of clients long polling the same server at the same time, then things could become a little problematic. But you just have to make sure to terminate that WebSocket connection once the delivery is made. Um, and then also you can only have, I think, 65,000 WebSocket connections open at one time on a given server. So like I said, we would introduce a load balancer uh, between the client and delivery uh, person and that server, such that all those web sockets are going to be split out relatively evenly among servers. Uh -huh. um, well, yes, the sixty-five thousand thing, I, I'm I'm not very sure about. You can use ports also. Uh, yeah, I thought but, it was that there are about sixty-five thousand open ports, but maybe don't quote me on that. I'm not one hundred percent sure. Yes, yes. So, uh, okay, okay. Interesting. So yes, that that takes care of the uh, you know 
you want to send real time updates you can go for long polling you can go for web sockets um yeah uh, what do you what do you think about web rtc <laughs> Oh, truthfully, I don't know anything about that. I've got to study that next. I keep hearing about it. Does that use UDP under the hood? I feel like it probably yes, does. Okay. Yes. In so, fact, uh, and one other benefit is that this delivery person, this client person, they can just connect with the server, get authenticated. And once they're authenticated, all they need to do is they need to communicate amongst each other. Uh, I so see. that takes care of the, the load on the server. But uh, it, it might be a little overkill. Uh, and it might, like this authentication thing, which is going on over here is a bit of a, is a cost in itself. Sure. Uh, how many people actually use the delivery tracking? It's not, it's not that people look at it for the next 10 minutes. It's not like Uber where you're waiting for something. It's True. more like you order something and then you're watching TV. That's a good point. Yeah, it could even just right. be something where you refresh. Um, I'm inter Yeah, I don't know much about RTP. I know it's like for streaming, but I guess you don't really care if there's a certain loss update for where a client is located. So I guess in that sense, UDP would probably be a little bit faster than uh, establishing a, a TCP connection because we just don't care if our data is out of order. Yes, um, right, exactly. And we don't care if our data reaches or not uh, to some extent. I mean, yeah, it's not yeah. like we don't care, but uh, it's more like it's a trade-off, yeah. Yeah, as long as we get enough of them, it should be fine, so, okay. Right, okay, this is great. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan. I, I think uh, if, you're, if you ask me, I, this was great. Uh, Geo sharding is something that I haven't really looked into much, uh, and it's good to actually see the algorithm play itself out uh, in this question. Uh, it's good that we also focused on one component of the delivery. That basically, we focus on the delivery system, right? Uh, one component of the DoDash system. So I think that to some extent allowed us to go deeper into the system instead of looking at it, uh, you know, at a very, very high level in which we would be thinking about user onboarding or payments and the same things would keep coming again and again. For sure. So in fact, yeah, instead of me giving a long winded explanation of what happened, uh, could you, could you tell me your thoughts right now? Like after this interview, what are you feeling? Like, how do you think? Things Absolutely. Went? Um, I'm actually not entirely sure because I've kind of brushed over like the, the Uber solution before. And this to me was very similar to that. Um, I know that they, they obviously have a really complicated thing going on, but as far as systems design problems go, I think it tends to get pretty simplified. And so I, I'm obviously super interested to see how Uber works these days or something like that. Um, but I'm curious to hear what, what you would have thought um, to do if not geo sharding, just because I know it has to be like a pretty low latency service where people are getting relatively tiled into the same area somehow. Um, I would, uh, yeah. This is this is the place where maybe we can uh, we can think about. This is our company, DoorDash, which uh, needs to scale. How do we do it? So I would the first thing I would do is: is there any open source technology which already does this? Um, so, or is there a solution which we can buy or rent off the shelf? So I think Post Postgres has something Postgres GIS, mm. uh, which does uh, which does this geo indexing. Right. Um, if this wouldn't work, then then I would go for yeah, a custom solution. But um, apart from that, like you mentioned, you made uh, you know you you mentioned examples like Redis, Cassandra. Um, similarly, if we can have these solutions taken care of by an open source solution, that would be amazing. Sure. Uh, if not open source, then something off the shelf. Uh, right. How I would go about doing this in case I had to do it myself, would be some sort of a combination of probably geo, geo hashing, uh, this quad tree also, which is another data structure, right. very similar to the geo hashing concept. Right. Uh, there's a, another data structure, which is, which helps you find distances, maybe a little more accurately, that's the Hilbert curve. Uh, but then, so the, the Hilbert curve is actually implemented by some open source solutions again, where you hash yourself onto a particular point and then we can tell how close you are from another point, looking at the distance in the Hilbert curve, similar to what you did. You, you had an index, which is telling you the distance based on the hash. So yes, yes. I, I think when it comes to 2D spaces, uh, breaking them down is, you basically have two options. Either you fit a curve through it, or you uh, split it into regions, smaller and smaller regions. So yeah. Yeah, I would I would probably choose the same algorithm, a very similar one, if not. 
yeah, I've got to look into the Hilbert curve. I kind of brushed over that when I was learning about uh, the geolocation stuff. But um, yeah, this was a cool problem. I appreciate you having me on the channel. I hope to have you on mine someday. Sure. Uh, let's let's do this again. And uh, thank you so much. If you're looking for evaluation, I think this was excellent. Um, appreciate it. And yeah, no wonder you're working at Google. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I got awesome. I got to get a little bit better, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jordan, for for joining us. Uh, and uh, guys, if you have any doubts or suggestions, you can leave them in the comments. Uh, I think Jordan will be uh, looking at the comments a little bit, uh, and we'll both try to answer to the best of our abilities. If you feel like some part of this could have been done better, please let us know. We are always looking to improve. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.